for another webinar at the Student Council for Entrepreneurship. My name is Karin Bado. I am the venture coach here, and uh, we have a special guest uh, from the Experiential Learning Department at the Asper School. Judy Jaisaraya is here with us. And uh, before we dive right into the presentation, I'm just gonna share with you a quick etiquette. All the questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. You can use the Q&A uh, box to ask the question throughout the webinar. You don't have to wait till the end. And uh, again, the webinar is recorded on the website. We want to make sure that you can always go back to that resource and keep using it to help you better your presentations. And uh, if you are not following us on our social media, this is the moment to grab your cell phone, um, to give us a follow. We have a LinkedIn account, an Instagram account, and a Twitter account. Um, this is where you will find out everything that's happening at the center. And with no further ado, I have a quick video that will introduce the center uh, and tell, tell you a little bit about what we do here. Let's talk about entrepreneurship. It's the light bulb moment from your first big idea. It's the decision to set out on a new path. It's the realization that entrepreneurship starts with a spark, and that spark starts here. At the Stu Clark Center, we're here to nurture your ideas and help spark your entrepreneurial spirit. How? How about competitive opportunities to free your inner entrepreneur? Advice from venture coaches who have walked the walk. Or some of the best networking events you'll find on campus. You'll find it all right here. By focusing on education, awareness, community, coaching, and connection, we build strong relationships with our students and do everything we can to help them on their journey to self-starting. At the Stu Clark Center, we thrive when you thrive. No idea is too big or too small. The Stu Clark Center is your one-stop shop for everything you need to start your journey. So why not start today? Perfect. Why not start today? Um, a little bit about myself. I am the venture coach. And what I do is just to provide guidance to student entrepreneurs that are looking to learn more about entrepreneurship. Um, I have a background in business administration, and I, I work with the entrepreneurs women entrepreneurs in the community. Um, really, there's no right or wrong and question. Any question you may have, feel free to book a meeting to discuss about your entrepreneurial idea. And uh, again, we are located on the second floor at the Drake Building inside the business school. And I would love for you to come say hi um, if you are here around at the university. And uh, I'm not alone. We have a team of wonderful experts that are here to support you as well in your journey. We have Debra Jonathan Young, our director, Lindsay Friesen, our marketing coordinator, Amy Jones, our program coordinator, and uh, Melita Sasek, our office coordinator. All of us would like to uh, support you, so feel free to drop by again if you're around at the University of Manitoba. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to one of us and we will be able to support you. Um, again, we really try to provide you a fast, fast, very easy way to access um, the Venture Coach. So if you don't know how to communicate or how to meet with me, it's pretty simple. You go on the website. Uh, my calendar is also linked to the platform called Startup Tree. And I'm inviting you to create a profile and uh, schedule a date, a time that works for you. We do in-person meetings as well as, well as virtual meetings, um, anything to your comfort. Again, you are invited to uh, book a meeting and uh, discuss your business ideas or your entrepreneurial ideas. Another great event that's happening tomorrow that I would like to share with you, we have a fire side chat with Marnie McBean, a three-time Olympic gold medalist, and we are also celebrating International Women's Day. So if you don't know what to do tomorrow, if you haven't uh, scheduled yet an event, Feel free to go on the website and RSVP for that. Um, it's going to be tomorrow at 1130. Everything again is online. Everything happens on Zoom. So hope to see you there tomorrow. Uh, we have a few webinars um, that we line up for the rest of the winter. 
and uh, you are invited to take a look and uh, reserve, come, sign up, share it with friends, family, anyone you know who might be interested um, to learn more about entrepreneurship. We have some great topic again there to provide you with guidance. Um, we have actually one that's not entrepreneurship related, but it is so important to take care of our mental health. So again, Healthy Entrepreneurs, Healthy Ventures, it's another webinar of, of ours happening in April. The lineup is there, everything is open. Make sure you go and you RSVP for our next event. Another great event that is happening this week, like there's a lot of stuff happening, a lot of great event happening at the center. And please check out the website. We have our international new venture championships happening uh, on from March 9 to 11 here in Winnipeg at the Fort Gary. And we are opening the, fin the finally, um, finalist round. So if you are wondering, can I come? I really want to get immersed into a business competition. Please check out the website and we really hope to see you um, on, on Saturday for the, the, the championship. With no further ado, I'm going to dive deep into introducing you the presenter that we have today. So Judy Jaisuraya is the lead of experiential learning here at the Asper School, and uh, she has been with the university for over a decade. Um, she has progressive experience with several departments within the university. Um, she has served as a business manager for the undergraduate medical education at the Max Raddy College. And uh, she was also an interim director in re alumni relationships. So she has so much experience in providing coaching uh, with two teams. So we are in good hands today. And Jerry, I'm gonna let you take over for the rest of the webinar. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Corinne. Let me just share mine. We'll switch off here. Uh, let me just see. Great. Maybe a nod or a thumbs up, Corinne, if you can see this. Great. Wonderful. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Judith Jaisuria. Um, Corinne, thank you very much for the lovely introduction. Um, I teach in our undergraduate and graduate programs here at the Asper School of Business. Um, and I'm um, also the lead of experiential learning. So um, that's learning by doing or active learning. And uh, a primary part of my portfolio is case competition. So I'm the faculty advisor to our national and international teams. Um, and I work towards developing a pipeline around case or otherwise known as consulting competition. So that's a little bit about my background and sort of how um, how I'm involved in and in helping uh, students prepare for their presentations and pitches. Um, so today I'm here to chat a little bit about um, how you can deliver your best presentation and your best pitch. I understand that we have people um, from Canada and the United States. We also have several competitors who will be competing this weekend. That's very exciting. I wish everyone the absolute best. And I hope that you'll be able to glean just a couple things from this presentation. We don't have a lot of time together, so I've kind of kept it a little bit light and hit a number of different areas, um, but feel free to ask me any questions at the end if you're looking for a, a deeper or richer response than, than what you're going to get at this presentation. Um, so maybe with that, I'll start. I'll, I'll flip over. How I've kind of put this together um, is it's obviously on communication, but I thought maybe I would deliver it in a series of eight tips uh, because I think that might be easier for everyone to grasp, maybe something to pick away from and, and pick what's relevant to you depending on where you are and what stage you are in developing a presentation or a pitch. So without further ado, let's talk about the first one. So the first one is, um, interestingly, I tell students this all the time, your presentation starts before you enter the room. So many people think it's when you get on stage or maybe perhaps when you say your first word into a microphone, but it actually starts well before that. Um, there are different types of competitions and different types of presentations. They vary in length. They vary in what you can bring into a presentation room. So some of these examples may be relevant to some of you out there and some of them may not be, but bear with me as, as we go through them. So the first one is that you may be able to take in um, a slide deck or a presentation, much like the one that I have here. 
Um, and that is something that you as a presenter can work on for the weeks or months in advance of your presentation. And the first thing that you want to think about is developing your slide deck in a systematic way so that you always know where you need to put the relevant content. So in class, how I teach students is the top of the slide is the summary statement. It's what the slide is about. If you're writing a paper, it would be your thesis statement. Um, the middle of the slide is all of the supporting evidence that supports that summary title. And what's on the bottom is a key takeaway. And the key takeaway is what's relevant to the firm or the investor or to the audience that you're presenting to. And when I talk about standardization, I standardize the pattern of this. So the summary title, the evidence, the key takeaway, and it exists in the same format on every slide. Um, also, you'll notice that there's some coloration on this slide with the key takeaway being the brightest. It's the one that's green, it pops out a little bit more. Um, and that's because I want from a visual standpoint for what's relevant, again, to the audience, the firm or the investor, and in whatever case your presentation is on, to the thing, the thing that stands out the most. Um, as an audience, we consume information through a number of different ways. And one primary way is through visuals. So if you can standardize your presentation, you teach the audience how to interpret that information so that they start to learn what information you're trying to put forward. In addition, it also helps you as a presenter, because if you know where to look on the slide, if you get lost or stuck or stumble a little bit, you can train yourself to look either up to the summary uh, line or down below to the key takeaway line, just so to get you back on track and so to help you remember your point. The other thing that you can do before your presentation start is manage your energy levels. Um, so this is something that ha might happen more immediately before you walk out onto a stage. You need to recognize if you need to increase or decrease your energy levels. So I'm sure some of us out there might get really excited, maybe nervous. You're kind of bouncing around. You want to deliver this presentation. If you, that's you, then you know you're going to need to decrease those energy levels to get you to focus and concentrate and ensure that you deliver the hard-hitting messages that you want to hit. Um, so I've had students in the past who've done Tai Chi or meditate or done something to kind of bring a center of calmness back before they walk out onto that stage. Alternatively, you might be someone that needs to increase your energy. Maybe you're feeling a little bit sluggish or tired. Um, sometimes we're in fast paced competitions where, you know, you have 90 minutes to prepare something and then you have to immediately walk out on stage and deliver a consulting presentation. You could be drained from an experience like that. I know it can often be taxing and take a lot of energy. So what you need to do is get your blood moving. You need to bring that energy back so you can deliver a vibrant presentation um, that's compelling. And so you could do anything like stand up, walk around, maybe do a couple of jumps. I have a, a colleague who swears by a couple jumping jacks before she walks into a room. Um, I was recently in Florida for a competition and our students took sort of a walk around the block, a walk outside to get some fresh air. So Anything you can do to either increase or decrease your energy level would be key because it will really change how you deliver that presentation and what kind of energy you bring to it. And again, that will depend on you um, as an individual. The next piece is to consider the layout of the room. And so you'll see through this presentation, I have some online and in-person tips, um, but obviously you want to recognize whether you're presenting online or in-person because that changes how you would deliver your presentation. You wanna ask if you can view the layout of the room or perhaps test the online platform before the presentation. You don't want any scary surprises, right? Because that could take you off track or make you a little bit nervous or you might have to deal you know, in a really agile way on the spot. There's always things that come up, of course, um, but knowing or being prepared might help alleviate some of those pain points. Um, you know, if you're in a competition, I know that there's several of you that are, that will be, you know, understanding, you know, where the judges will be in proximity to the stage, or if there's a timekeeper or a room host and trying to be cognizant of where they're going to be situated, information like that will help you um, prepare for where you need to look and where you need to be and who you need to really focus on as you're delivering the presentation. Um, we've lived in an era of, of Zoom or Teams or whatever your favorite online platform is, and we know that things go wrong. Uh, so having and testing that online platform will help you ensure that your presentation will be delivered as smoothly as possible. I have a couple more things um, to suggest before you start your presentation. So for virtual, speaking of online presentation, your background really matters, right? 
Um, you want to test that background. Sometimes it can glitch. Sometimes it can hide half of your face. Um, you want to be sure that you're visible um, because presentation skills come orally, visually, uh, from your body language, etc. Check your lighting. Um, if you're shaded or in the dark, it might impede your audience from seeing your facial expressions. You want to ensure that you have a strong connection. Of course, you don't want to lose internet access. You want to be sure that all your advices are charged and ready to go. Um, and you want to position the laptop so that your notes aren't hidden. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about eye contact, but you want people to be able to see you, you can deliver so much of a message through your eyes and through your body language. And so if you're hidden, if you're positioned uh, incorrectly, then they won't be able to see that. And it sort of impedes how compelling that message is. Of course, if you're in person, which I know a number of you will be, and especially now that in-person competitions are coming back and in-person presentations are coming back, you want to consider a couple of other things, right? Ask about the clicker. Do you have a clicker? How will slides be changed? If you have a large um, appendices, will you have access to a keyboard to click through them? What's the size of the screen? You know, what do you need to develop? What kind of, is it? Is it a projector? Is it in a hotel with dimmer lights? All of those things are going to change how you develop a slide deck what color colors you're going to use. Um, we know that sometimes lighter colors like pastels tend to be washed out if the lighting isn't great on the screen. So all of those things might help you make different decisions about how you choose to visualize the information that you have. You might also want to know if there's any materials that will be provided to judges, you know, things that they'll have access to. Are they going to be reviewing those materials in advance or during the presentation? The reason why this matters is it helps you understand how much context the judges will have to your material. If they get a lot of time with materials in advance, they might ask you deeper or more richer questions because they've had a lot of time for that information to sink in. If they get it on the spot, well, they might not be looking up at you because they might be encompassed with reading the information that's provided. And if they don't get anything at all, you might need to change a little bit more of your content to ensure that you're giving them a wealth of information that contextualizes the presentation that you're delivering. So you can tell sort of in-person virtual, there are a number of things to consider. I left both in because I know that we're working in a bit more of a hybrid world where um, presentations are delivered in all sorts of formats. The last thing uh, that I'll say is around attire. You should pre-plan your attire. Um, you want to ask your, the competition or, you know, the, the business or the investor or, you know, depending on sort of the context of the presentation pitch that you're delivering, if there is required attire. Um, we know pre-pandemic, things tended to be a bit more formal. Um, Post-pandemic, we're seeing the emergence of more casual business trends. But um, you may want to consider if there's any requirements around that because that will help you plan exactly what you want to wear. I always tell students, choose something that makes you comfortable. If you're not comfortable standing in high heels, wear flats. If you want to wear a blazer, wear a blazer if you know you get cold. Make sure that you're comfortable because you don't want to deal with all of those externalities when you're delivering a presentation. And with comfortable, I also say confident. So make sure that you feel good with what you're wearing. You know, you're there to sell your idea, to sell yourself, um, to get people to believe and trust in what you're saying. You want to deliver a really, really strong and compelling and persuasive presentation. And that starts from within. So if you believe that about yourself, if you walk on stage feeling like you are so prepared, comfortable, and confident with what you're saying, that's going to instill confidence in the judges. Um, so it might sound a little bit silly for me to talk about attire, but remember that as humans, we, we make decisions with what we see often, right? So when we see a presenter walk on stage and we see that confidence, we start to believe in their message. Okay, tip number two, practice makes perfect. It's absolutely true. Um, you want to know, you know, the rules of your presentation. How long is your presentation? How long is the question period? So, for example, for the upcoming competition that the Stu Clark Center uh, is hosting, I, I understand it's a 15 minute presentation and a 10 minute Q&A in the first round. And then in the finals, a 15 minute presentation and a 15 minute question period. 
And so that five minutes, for example, is really important to consider. It means that judges get to ask more questions. Um, and so understanding the rules of the presentation helps you understand how much information to put in and what sort of content that you think you need to prioritize. Sometimes you might only have 90 seconds to deliver a presentation. And I've been there too. You know, I've seen 90 seconds, two minutes, three minutes, um, 10, 15, 25, 30, an hour. Um, and understanding those parameters really changes the content that you choose to deliver. Corinne only gave me 45 minutes, so I'm on a clock. Uh, and so I know I need to manage my time to be sure that I'm hitting the most salient points. Um, and it would be something for all of you to consider out there as well. Time is really valuable. When you're pitching to a business, a firm, an investor, they often don't have a lot of time. And so being really respectful of people's times is quite key because it gives them the impression that you value um, value their time. Um, other things might be, you know, things like, will the time be visible? So, you know, I've seen some competitions where they hide a clock from you. You kind of have to develop your own internal clock through practices. Some other competitions are much kinder and they'll show you a clock or they'll give you warnings. Understanding what those are is going to be quite key to be sure that you're on pace and on track with your information. Uh, practice, practice, practice. I'm sorry. I couldn't think of another way to say it, but it's absolutely true. Practice is very key. Um, when you present without practicing, sometimes you tend to talk around a point or be indirect with the message that you're trying to say. Practicing allows you to bring focus uh, to the content that you're delivering. It allows you to choose you know, the correct words and ensure that the language that you're putting forward meets exactly the needs of the content that you're trying to drive. If you need to, craft a script. Uh, Sometimes I think scripts get a little bit of a bad name and I don't think they need to. I think crafting a script allows you again to focus that content, prioritize the most important pieces. Um, and what a script looks like is different to each individual. For some individuals, a script is completely written out word for word, full sentences. For others, it might be a series of bullet points. Uh, that they just need to hit to keep them on track. So you'll notice, for example, on my slides, I'm following a bit of an order, but I haven't written out every single thing that I'm talking about. I have the main pieces here to ensure that I keep the content focused and digestible. I always encourage people to practice in front of an audience. Um, it will help um, you sort of get feedback and see what their reactions are. Uh, when I teach, I teach... Um, and I lecture, and I lecture in front of groups of students, but I always read their body language to see if the points that I'm making are coming across. So for example, I can't see any of you today, but Corinne has left her camera on, which has been very lovely. So I can see when she leans forward and I understand, okay, yeah, that point landed. Um, or, you know, perhaps when um, she does a slight nod or a half smile, I'm like, okay, these points are landing. I can, there people are with me. They're following the narrative that I'm putting forward. The same thing will happen to you when you're in front of an audience. So don't leave that till you get to the judges. Instead, start early to to see how your points are landing, how the ebb and flow of your presentation works. If people are understanding what you're saying, they're comprehending your message. Pra practicing in front of an audience also allows you to mimic the presentation setting. You know, if those of you aren't going to the competition this weekend, there's not it's not possible for you perhaps to have a hundred people in a room, but you could put a panel of judges in front of you or your colleagues or some friends to mimic what that presentation setting is like. I'd encourage you to dress up, wear that suit if that was what you're planning to do or, you know, the shoes that you're planning to wear. Um, try to mimic it as much as possible so that you get a sense of familiarity with the presentation and what it will be like. So then it doesn't feel new when you're walking onto that stage for the first time. In fact, it feels practiced and rehearsed and um, like an old friend. Finally, record yourself and play it back. This is a kind of an interesting one. Um, I don't know a ton of people who do it, but I promise you I swear by it. Um, you know, you don't always get the opportunity to practice in front of people. And, and when you do, sometimes you'll practice in front of them and then they'll give you feedback. And I don't know if there's anybody else out there that's like me, but often when I present, I can't remember sometimes all of the things that I've said or all of the examples that I used. It goes by so fast in a blink of an eye and I might forget some of those moments. So if you record yourself and then, you know, grab a bucket of popcorn, sit back and, and play it, you'll be able to kind of see what other people see. 
be able to hear yourself, your tone, your pitch. Um, you'll be able to assess your body language or using your hands, the cadence that you use. Um, if you're a fast speaker or a slow speaker, and you'll be able to correct for pace. Uh, it's tough to do that from memory. Um, and sometimes it can be tough to sort of remember a person's feedback and exactly what happened in that specific moment. So recording yourself and playing it back is quite key. Okay, so let's move on to the next tip. So tip number three, um, a well-communicated idea is the best idea. Um, and so this is purely on oral communication. So your speaking style. Your volume um, is, is so important. You want to ensure that you project your voice. Depending on the size of the room and the number of people in it, that volume needs to change. You can imagine with a lot more people in a room and perhaps you may have a mic, other times you may not, um, you'll want to consider how your voice carries. In a larger room, it can feel cavernous. And so you might need to speak up a little bit more. There are different ways to do this, though. Um, one of my colleagues is a very soft speaker. And so even though we tell him, speak up, speak up more, you know, it's just really difficult for him to do. So what he will do is change his body position. He'll walk a couple more steps forward to the judges, knowing that it will decrease the space between the speaker and the audience. Therefore, he doesn't have to carry his voice as much. He doesn't have to, you know, change his volume as much as he would have before. So Volume is interesting. As I said, it's not always about how loud you are. It could also be within proximity to the people who you're speaking to. Modulation. So modulation is about how you vary your tone to emphasize points. So you'll notice even in this presentation, and I'm hoping you're picking it up, I'm trying to deliver what I'm, I'm telling you guys to do. Sometimes I speak a little bit louder. Sometimes I speak a little bit quieter. You'll notice even, and we'll get to body language later, but how I'm trying to sort of persuade you to think about some of these tips is by varying my, my voice tone. Um, and that's because I'm trying to get you to believe in what I'm in essence selling. I'm trying to get you to believe the story that I'm putting down. And so by changing my tone a little bit, I'm emphasizing kind of key points, key tips, key areas of focus. And then when there might be something that's a little bit less salient or an ancillary point or a little bit more description, I might soften that tone a little bit and bring it more towards the back. Pacing is really important. I know that there are different types of people. We all exist on a spectrum. Some people speak very fast and other people speak very slow. Um, and you want to consider that pacing, but that pacing in conjunction to the content that you're delivering. So I wouldn't think of it as keep one pace the entire time. I would more think of it as what's the content that you're trying to deliver and let the content drive your speaking choices. So here's an example. I um, was working with a group of engineering and business students in preparation for an engineering and business competition. And so um, the engineering side of that presentation was quite complex. It was very intricate. They needed to go through different steps of a system. And so for something like that, where there's a high degree of complexity, and we want to be sure that the audience was with us every step of the way, we slowed down the pace of that presentation to be sure that those points were very digestible and that the audience could, you know, walk alongside with us and understand the complexities of that project. So that's an example of how content can drive pace. I say that, though, but also we want to ensure that we never impede comprehension. So make sure that comprehension is always kept at the forefront when you consider pace. So you'll notice even now, sometimes I'll speed up or slow down, depending on the point that I'm trying to put across. You know, if it's a quick tip, I might slow it down um, or speed it up, depending on, you know, how I think the message needs to be delivered. Um, I have a couple online tips here. I know most of us are going back to in-person presentations, but I wanted to include them. I think the world of work is changing um, and we want to think about presentations in a number of different contexts. Um, my tip for an online presentation, I'm not doing this, so I feel like this might be a little bit uh, interesting, but you might want to sit up straight when you're delivering a presentation, or some people might even stand up. 
Um, and that's because uh, sometimes you can get a little bit sluggish sitting down. And so if we want to sort of pretend that we're in that in-person world, but online, you might want to change your body position a little bit. It will actually help you with your volume and your modulation, because often sometimes we forget to modulate when we're behind a screen um, and we do it much more easily when we're in person. So doing your best to kind of mimic that in-person setting might be quite helpful. Uh, and then, of course, mute yourself. This is a classic one. I feel like how many times over the last two years have I forgotten to mute myself? But um, it'd be quite pivotal to mute yourself when you're not speaking, just so you don't get any background noise or, um, you know, a dog barking or a cat walking across the screen or whatever it may be that exists in our online world. Okay, let's go to the next tip. Communication is multidimensional. Um, this one is a really important one to me. Um, I think when people think of presentations and pitches, they think purely about oral communication, verbal communication. But communication is so much more than that. It's nonverbal. It's also visual. It's it's how people um, comprehend and understand the messages that you're delivering. And so for those of you who are entering this competition this weekend, I really encourage you to recognize this one um, because when you're trying to sell that idea, you're selling from a number of different points of view. So when you're looking at perfecting that presentation or pitch, you have to ensure that you're perfecting all of these things and not just one. Because if you only do one, it becomes imbalanced and then your presentation isn't as compelling as what you want it to be. So I'll start with eye contact. Um, I think that's the first one here. Um, eye contact is very important. You'll notice that I'm trying to maintain as much eye contact as possible. Crin's keeping me going by looking right back at me. Um, eye contact um, allows you to build trust with that audience. When you look somebody dead in the eye and you speak directly to them, they feel like you're um, you're delivering a message that's meant for them and them alone. Um, there's a sense of intimacy that gets created with that level of eye contact. And in that intimacy, you're able to deliver really nuanced and curated messages that feel very relevant to that audience. So if you're trying to convince an investor or you're sitting in front of a business or a firm, you know, trying to tell them, you know, take this direction or, you know, completely pivot, you want them to believe in you. You want them to have that trust with you. You want them to feel like you completely understand their business because you're talking about something that is incredibly personal to them. And because it's so personal, it's hard for them to make a change. The only way for them to make that change is if they trust you. And eye contact is the first step towards gaining that trust. It also instills a sense of confidence with between the audience and you. That confidence is really important. If you're asking somebody to make a big decision, perhaps part with some money, or again, take your word to change their operations completely or enter a new market segment, you want them to feel confident with the information that you're putting out because people won't make a big change if they don't feel like you know what you're talking about. So if you're looking down or away or up, or at your notes, or just at the screen behind you, they're not able to see how confident you are in the material that you're delivering. To them, even though it may not be your intent, to them it speaks of uncertainty. And that uncertainty can be crippling if they are trying to make a decision. And so you want to show that confidence so that they can feel more certain about the direction that you're proposing so that they say yes to whatever you're trying to ask them to do. You have a better chance of having strong eye contact when you have practiced your presentation. Um, and you'll see me kind of jump around a little bit. I know we talked earlier about practicing, but the more that you practice, the more confident you are with your message, the more you have it internalized, the more that you can deliver it. And so that will help you maintain eye contact because then you're not looking down at notes um, or looking behind you. You know, this is a really interesting one for me. And, and you know, I, I, you know, as I, I've been doing this for about 10 years, I'm sorry, I think I may have forgotten to, to talk about that earlier. Um, but I've seen changes in how individuals have delivered presentations and pitches. And something that I've really noticed since the pandemic is that we've 
we've really become reliant on notes, um, you know, especially in, in a virtual setting. We've become used to, you know, having post-it notes beside us or a script taped up, uh, you know, where nobody else can see it or, or maybe, um, you know, like a Word document pulled up or, or something. Um, but we no longer have that ability in an in-person environment, especially if you want to maintain eye contact. So we kind of have to decouple ourselves from this idea of having a script or notes or, you know, again, constantly looking at behind us if we want to maintain eye contact. So this is something that um, I really encourage you guys to think about in a different way. However, we all make mistakes. We know that, right? It can be really tough to memorize everything. Um, also, nerves can get the best of us. It happens to everybody. Um, you could have the best, most well-rehearsed presentation in the world, and then you get up on, on stage and, you know, you might blank for a second. And so that's where that standardizing of slide layout really helps. So for example, you'll notice that I've standardized my slide deck to some degree. Um, it's different than the sample that I showed you earlier, but my tips are always in the biggest font, they're off uh, to the left-hand side of the screen. They're bold. They're bright. That's where my I've trained myself to always look in case I forget what the next what I'm talking about or what the next point will be. I have to remember that the most hardest hitting message on my screen is the one that's to the left. And if I can deliver that message, then I know I've hit the most salient point here. Then you'll also notice that through coloration and font size and through visuals, I've also scaled the degree of information, right? So the most important thing is the tip on the left-hand side. And then I have sort of have these red bars placed throughout the presentation. That's most of my secondary pieces. If I get lost in a topic, if I forget, for example, that I'm talking about eye contact, I just have to train myself to look at those red bars and I'll remember, okay, this is what I need to hit. That way I'm not talking around a point or trailing off or leading you through some crazy path of talking. Um, it's, it's, it's so that there's a guide for me to follow. And your guide doesn't have to look the same as mine or you know the example that I showed you earlier, but standardizing that guide for yourself will help because as I said, things happen all the time and it's pivotal um, that you find a way to direct that presentation. Don't forget you own that time. You own that presentation and pitch content. You're the one that's running the room. You're running the room through the presentation and you're also running the room through the question and answer period. So you want to set the tone and you set that tone by being prepared, standardizing your slides and really focusing on all forms of communication. I have a little bit of an online tip here. Obviously, we can't get away from it. Um, if you do rely on a script in an online presentation, I'd encourage you to perhaps tape a photo just on the camera at the top of the screen so that you're looking directly at the camera and not looking down. I'm a little bit, I have a bit of a bad habit with this. I tend to look down. So I'm right now looking at Corinne's face instead of looking up at uh, the screen. But when you look up at the screen, especially if you're in a closer proximity than I am, people will be able to uh, see your eyes and they'll think that you're looking directly at them as opposed to looking slightly down. Body language and positioning. So again, on this sort of concept of multidimensional communication, um, body language and positioning is so key because when an audience is looking at you, they're hearing you, but they're also seeing you on that stage or on that computer. Um, you want to think in an in-person environment of removing barriers. I know that there's often a tendency to speak behind a podium, but podiums create distance. There's a barrier that's pulled up. It, it sort of doesn't allow you to create a sense of intimacy with those judges. And you're trying to create, you know, a circle of trust, a space where they're going to sort of fall with you into this presentation and, and start to believe what you're selling. So I always encourage students walk out and away from a bar uh, barrier like a podium. If, you know, there's table perhaps you can walk closer to the table where the judges are sitting create that sort of space and that uh, dynamic between you and the judges uh, so that you can foster that stronger sense of trust um, these might sound a little bit simple to you on this list, but again, you know, we've lost a couple things since the pandemic and it never hurts to be reminded of some key things here. Uh, don't block the screen, uh, quite key, especially um, in, a, in a circumstance where the judges don't have your um, presentation in advance. They're going to be quite reliant on seeing visuals that you put up. And so blocking the screen prevents them from understanding and comprehending material. 
step forward, but refrain from pacing. So you'll notice in this presentation that there are times where I lean forward. I'm doing sort of the online version of stepping forward. Sometimes I'll lean back a little bit um, and I'm doing it to emphasize a point. You can do that in person too. Take a step forward if you want to take a step forward. Build a stronger sense of connection with your audience, but don't pace. Pacing can be distracting and it can be hard for someone to follow. Use your hands. I'm using them now, right? To emphasize when I truly believe in something, when I'm making a really definitive statement or a point. And then a soft smile or a nod of agreement will show your confidence. You know, sometimes we are transparent with our faces. We show nerves. Um, but showing that you're confident, as I said, like all the world of difference for someone to believe in what you're saying. I talked a little bit about the first online tip, but I'll talk about the second. Position your camera. You know, I've tried to position it so you don't you see more than my face because I want you to see my shoulders and I want you to see my hands and I want you to see when I'm moving forward or back. So really consider what people can see of you um, when you make your decisions about nonverbal communication. Tip number six is to define yourself as a storyteller. Um, when you are standing on a stage, you are a storyteller. You are telling a narrative, a story, and you want to embody certain characteristics because when people start to see you as a storyteller, they'll start to, again, find you compelling. And so when you want to be found compelling, when you want to be found persuasive, there are characteristics that you want to embody. For example, being authentic. Uh, when you're authentic, when you're sharing a real experience or you're talking about a real need or your background, being authentic allows people to, to see kind of who you really are. Um, and it helps instill that confidence that I was talking about earlier. You want to be confident. If you're asking somebody for funds, if you're, again, trying to get them to change direction, you want people to know that you're developing or you're delivering rather information with certainty. Um, you want them to trust you um, and you they only trust they will only trust people who they find confident, especially with something that's so personal to them. And work is so personal to so many of us. I mentioned trustworthiness a number of times, um, and that goes hand in hand with likability. Um, if you are doing business with someone, you want you're it's in a relationship, right? You're creating a relationship with somebody else, and being likable um, is quite key to furthering that relationship. And of course, professional. Um, these are people's businesses, their livelihoods, their place of work. It's personal to them. Um, it's their own funds. Hard work, to, you know, hard work and hard effort has gone behind so many of these these pieces. So being professional shows that you take it seriously, that you're giving it the thought that it needs. On this theme of storytelling, um, so if you're the storyteller, know that your audience loves a good story. And that's tip number six. Presentations and pitches are really nothing more than storytelling exercises. You're taking somebody on a journey. That journey could be five minutes long or it could be an hour long, um, but it's still a journey. Um, so some things that you may want to consider, um, you might want to open with a story, a short narrative. Uh, it could be um, a personal experience. It could be um, showcasing the need that's out there. But a little bit of a story or a hook, as some people might describe it, really helps capture the attention of the audience. Remember, I said your presentation starts before you enter a room um, and it starts uh, before you enter a room, but remember that it starts from the moment that you start striding onto that stage. Uh, they're going to be watching you. As soon as you say your first word, they're going to be listening to you. So starting off really strong, trying to capture your audience in the palm of your hand is quite pivotal. Being descriptive um, and adding in examples are quite key. Um, description and examples can take conceptual points and make them much more granular. So it can help people identify with the content that you're trying to say a lot more easily. Uh, you'll notice throughout this webinar, I've sort of tried to pepper in examples here and there because sometimes it just helps to be able to relate to something that can be understood. Asking rhetorical questions, of course, this one is we ta is talked about often. Planting a question out there is great, especially if you're talking to somebody who's a judge, right? Judges, by virtue, ask questions all the time. So if you say a question that they're exactly thinking of, it helps form sort of a bond between you and the judges. It makes the judges think, yeah, you know, we really thought right, quite robustly about the topic that you're putting forward. Use a name. Uh, a name is quite helpful. And I don't mean a consulting name of, or, or, you know, a business name. Of course, you should be using those. But listen to when the judges or your audience introduces themselves. 
when they introduce themselves, they're going to say their names. And so in the middle of your presentation, if you can add somebody's name, you'll notice that I've said Corinne's name every now and then. And when I do, she kind of smiles a little bit. She pays attention a little bit more. I'm hoping Corinne that that's correct. Um, judges will do the same, right? So if you drop somebody's name a couple times throughout their presentation, it helps them pay attention a little bit more. And it feels personal to them, like you're talking directly to them. And finally, the last one on there is tailor your presentation. It goes side by side with knowing your audience. Um, you need to know your audience to figure out what language to use. You know, for example, when I'm teaching to undergraduate students, the language that I use is very different than when I'm teaching to graduate students because I'm trying to speak in a way that they're gonna be able to comprehend that information and relate to that information. So knowing your audience might help you figure out what sort of language to use. If you have really finance or quantitative people in the room, you might change in the information that you're delivering. Um, if, you know, if you have somebody with a wealth of business experience in the room, you might change some of the examples that you're using. Um, so things to think about. Um, it's really important that you personalize the content in your presentation. Don't use the same presentation or pitch for every audience. Um, when you do that, it becomes generic. It's less personal, it's less intimate, it's less customized, it's less curated. And people want to feel special, they want to feel important. And how you do that is by tailoring that presentation um, depending on the audience that you have. Okay, I know I'm trying to be mindful of time. I, I know that uh, I only have a couple more tips left, so I'll promise you I'll be quick. Uh, so tip number seven is um, consider the rise and fall. So if the first half of the presentation that I'm delivering today was about content and communication, this middle section is all about storytelling, which I think is really at the heart of any presentation and pitch. Every story, no matter how short or how long, has a rise and a fall. There's a central theme to every good story. Think about the latest TV show you watch. There's a central theme. There's major and minor story arcs at play. There might be a romantic love interest. A murder might happen. Um, a mystery might be uncovered. Somebody might have to, you know, overcome something. And then there's always a call to action. There's always something left for the audience to take away. And that's what you want your content to do in your presentation. You want to mimic the rise and fall of a really good story. So you want to consider the structure and the flow. You want to consider the characters in your story. Those might be the stakeholders of the business. You want to talk about the challenge, right? Describe the pain points, the limiting factors, but then talk about the opportunity, what's out there, what's there to be captured. You want to make this story memorable. Go back and think about your some of your favorite fairy tales. The ones that stick in your mind are the ones that are the most memorable, and you want your story to be memorable. People who listen to presentations and pitches listen to so many of them every day, and so it can be really hard for them to remember all of them. So finding a golden nugget, making it memorable, crafting a really good tale, a really good narrative will help them remember your presentation because you want to be memorable in that way. I have a little note at the bottom, which is planting with intent. Storytellers can plant with intent. They intentionally drop pieces of messaging throughout their entire pitch and presentation. They drop these little breadcrumbs throughout, uh, leaving kind of a, a trail for the audience to follow. Um, you can plant seeds at the beginning that foreshadow what's to come. And all of those are intentional decisions. They don't happen through happenstance. They aren't just magically occur. They are all intentional. Everything that you do as a presenter is intentional from what you wear to how you speak, to what's on your slides, to how you prepare. You can control this. You can even plant you know, some questions or some gaps for judges to naturally ask questions. So I encourage you to think about how intentional messaging and delivery is. Last tip, I promise, Corinne, last tip. Um, the question period, um, and it's what I want to end with, is very powerful. Often, those who are presenting focus on the core presentation, and they sort of leave the question period to the last bit. But the question period is my favorite part. If you ask any student of mine, they'll tell you that Judy loves a really good question period. And that's because that's where we can see the true kind of wealth of information the presenter has. We see their critical thinking. We see their agility. We see how much work they've done. Um, and I love that because it feels like a very authentic experience. It's very important. It furthers the recommendation. It clarifies any of that ambiguity. 
it can highlight some quantitative analysis, you know, things that you might not have been able to get through in your core presentation. Um, and it also showcases an appendices if you're allowed to have one. Um, you want to consider a couple things when you look at a question period. I understand that there might be some people presenting by themselves, but there might also be some people presenting in a group. And so when you're trying to navigate that unpredictable situation of a question period, you want to know your team. You want to know what speaker resonates with the best type of question. So, for example, um, if there's a marketing question and you know you have a speaker on your team who can paint a beautiful picture of what a visual could look like, you want to kind of know their talents. If you know there's something quick on their feet, they're perhaps the most agile speaker, you might want to be able to leverage that person in a different way. Um, you want to consider who might need a little bit more time to answer a question, especially if they have to do a calculation on the spot. They might need to take a little bit more of a back step, so you might need to give them the space to do that. And finally, you want to consider the number of times that each person speaks, because uh, you want to appear as a cohesive and a collective group. So I have a couple of very quick examples. So in example one, throwing to a team member. You never want to say somebody's name at the end of a sentence because then they're not prepared to deliver that response. So mention their name at the beginning of the response. In my example here, I say, before Arlie speaks to costs, let me blah, 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 answer that question. So that way, Arlie's prepared that she might have to step up and say that answer. So you never leave it till the end because then they would be, have time to prepare a response. A second one here is maybe breaking down a multi-part question. Sometimes judges ask two or three questions in a row, and it can be a lot to manage. It's never an issue to say, I'm going to answer the first question, Addie will respond to the second. Or, you know, you could even ask to repeat that question. Hold on, do I have you correctly? Can you, is question one this, or is question two this? So don't worry about taking the time to unpack a very stacked question. And then finally, and last example here is delaying a response. Uh, this happens all the time. I can't tell you how many times I've heard a student say, that's a great question. And then a judge will say, well, not every question is a great question. So try to come up with a couple of lines that you can say, like, thank you for your question, or um, great point. Or you could even do, my favorite one is actually repeating a question, because then it's just, you know, do I understand you correctly? Are you asking this? It's a great delaying tactic to give you some time to think if you know you need some time to put an answer together. The last thing I'll leave you with is this. Um, I always say this. It's probably my most, <laughs> my thing that I say the most. And it's, you can have the best idea in the world, the absolute best one, but it loses its value completely. Its value falls if it's not understood. Um, and so you could be the smartest person out there, but if you're not prepared, if you can't communicate that idea, if you um, unintentionally put barriers up that prevent the audience, the judge, the investor, the business from understanding that idea, the value of that idea is completely lost. So I encourage you to consider some of the content in this webinar as you put together your presentations and pitches to protect that value of that idea and to ensure that all the hard work that you have done um, can be protected, grown, and nurtured. So thank you very much. Corinne, I'm sorry if I took a little bit too long there, but. No, like you had so many great points. I was just smiling and nodding because I could see myself just practicing what you just said. Uh, I'm just going to take a quick look. It's the time for the question. If anybody has a question, it's, it would be the perfect time to ask a question. I have a question myself. I feel like, do, do you feel in a group presentation, do you feel one person has to rise up as a leader and kind of help, especially with the Q&A, when you say, you know, make sure that you say someone's first name and give them the title. Do you feel it's a good way to kind of handle the Q&A, to have one person kind of stepping into the challenge to better organize things? Yeah, you know, I've seen different styles. Sometimes I'll see a style where there is actually a defined leader who will handle most of the questions and then allocate to the team. And then I've seen another style where it's a little bit more, um, a little bit more even. Um, and I think that's a stylistic preference. I'll tell you mine. Um, I pref prefer the latter. I prefer when we have a cohesive team. I always tell um, the, the students that I work with as they prepare for these national and international presentations, the sign of a really strong team is if 
if you can answer a question that wasn't in the presentation section that you delivered. So for example, um, you know, when a market, a, a per, per, perhaps a person with a more marketing perspective can answer a finance question. And the reason I say it's a sign of a strong team is because it means that everybody knows that material. They fully believe in it. They fully understand it. They understand where it starts and where it ends. Um, and to me, that's just a sign of a group of people really worked well together. So that's my favorite one. Wow, that's so great. And I have another question. I know this was so insightful and I've learned so much from what you just shared. Um, the blink moment. Everybody have been, I've been through it when you know everything, but then you have that moment where there's a blink, you cannot remember anything. How do you bounce back from that during a presentation? Yeah, I know that's a really tough one. You know, it's funny, you can be the most prepared, right? And then it happens. It happens all the time. Um, I have a couple of responses to this. And, it, you know, I think that we all know that we're human beings and things happen. Um, it depends on the, the the type of blank that it is. You know, if it's a short one, um, you might be able to overcome it. You might be able to quickly dart your eyes, as I said, to the top or the bottom of a slide deck, or in my case, to the left-hand side uh, to just sort of recover and remember what the content is. So there's those pieces as well. Um, sometimes, you know, if it's a longer one, it's less, it's more difficult to hide. I've seen people make a joke out of it or laugh. Um, it's only awkward if you make it awkward. It's kind of the best thing I would say there. Um, if you seem scared or nervous or frightened or upset, you project that emotion onto the audience, right? And then those people will believe that. So you really have to, I think, sort of control those emotions. And we know that's inevitable. It will happen. But um, there are so many ways that you, you can control that setting. And I say it again, you own that time. That is your presentation. It is your question period. So you have the complete ability to control it. Uh, thank you so much, Julie, um, for this moment. Thank you for your time. Um, this was one of my greatest webinars, uh, to be honest, as someone who's learning to do public speaking. There were so many great nuggets in there. And uh, yes, the webinars has been, have been recorded and it will be posted on the website for anyone that is asking um, if you can have access to the slide. Uh, we will send an email just to resume everything that was done today with um, the permission of Judy. We'll be able to get, get that to you as well. Again, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for joining us. And we're gonna conclude for today. Thank you, Judy, for that great webinar. Thank you for your time. And you really know your stuff. <laughs> you are a true coach. And uh, we really hope to have you around. You are very welcome to come to the competition to give us some feedback as well and probably encourage the team if you have some time. But uh, yeah, everybody, thank you for joining. Have a great rest of the afternoon and hope to see you on our next webinar.